Hello again, everyone. This is Tom Sully from CPWR. This is a continuation from the HASCOM session that hopefully you've already taken. Hopefully you've also downloaded and have a copy of the exercises, the three different exercises that go along with this presentation. But this is gonna be on chemical toxicology. This is gonna then be discussing what actually then might happen to you physically if you get exposed to some of the different chemicals out on the job sites. So after we're done with this section, hopefully then you'll get a, an understanding and, and actually get a feel for what are the potential effects of the chemicals that you could come in contact with out on construction sites. And as we go through this, you'll, very, you'll see on the very next slide a graphic representation of not just chemicals, but even cement has the potential for affecting the human body. So I've, I, the next slide does have some pictures on that might be a little graphic for some people, but it just gives you a good representation. We'll talk about the, the five different ways or the different routes, if you will, the chemicals can get into your body and cause some of these different effects that we'll discuss during this, this uh, module. We'll also then describe the difference between an acute exposure and a chronic exposure and how the difference might make a huge difference to you and how it affects you. And we'll finish up this, this module or this section by talking about the different exposure levels that have been established that have different agencies put energy and effort into creating what they deem safe levels of exposure for contractors to then make sure their employees are protected if they get at the point that they reach those different dangerous limits, exposure limits. So like I said, this very next slide is a little graphic, so hopefully no one um, gets bothered with it too much, but it just gives you a representation of what could happen with exposure to Porter cement. The picture in the top right-hand corner was a gentleman who was kneeling and had the wet cement that permeated through his jeans while he was kneeling on the wet cement, trawling it out, leveling it off. The other one actually on the thigh ended up with it getting spilled on his thigh and then him working with wet cement on his thigh and the burn that subsequently came from that. The picture at the very bottom is actually a cleaning solution or a solvent that unfortunately this individual got the 100% version of the cleaning solvent on his arm as opposed to what it would then affect or how it might affect him when it was diluted. He was in the process of putting it together to go ahead and mix it up to the proper strength when he got the full concentration spilled on his arm. But that's what toxicology is all about. It's the study of and looking at what the different chemicals can do and how they might affect our bodies if we come in contact with them. We have to then know and realize that chemicals in and around us can affect us and can cause some serious long-term and potentially short-term repercussions. So with any kind of chemical exposure, the, the measurement is, in with it, is, is with what's called a dose response. And it's looking at what is the actual dose of the chemical you're being exposed to and what is the overall response then of that exposure of that chemical or to that toxic environment in the human body. You have to realize all substances have the potential of being toxic to us. It was amazing years ago when they first came out with the Wii gaming system. They had a radio station that had a, a radio promotion that they're giving away a Wii gaming system and they had a lady that actually overdosed on water. The actual, the actual thing they were doing is trying to drink as much water as they could before they had to go Wii to win the Wii gaming system. This lady overdosed on water. So just about anything out there has the potential of being toxic or dangerous to us, depending on the concentration, depending on the amount. So what we're gonna look at here first is our first activity. It's the very top of your your activity sheet. Think about five different ways, you know, it, hopefully you, you can come up with maybe five different ways, but how your body might react if you get exposed to a chemical or if you even get exposed to a physical hazard. What are some of the things that could happen to you or how your body could, could be uh, affected? I'm going to go ahead and be quiet for about a minute 
and uh, come back and we'll run through some of those different reactions that could, or the outcomes that could come from these exposures. Okay, hopefully you then all have had a chance to put down at least a couple of your thoughts of what might happen to you. As we run through this, this is not in any kind of order. Uh, these, these could then be reactions or could be outcomes of exposures to, again, either a chemical or a physical hazard. One of the extreme ones would be your injury or an amputation. Hopefully no one in here ever has to experience that, but unfortunately that is something fairly common in the construction injury is, or an industry is that both injury and potential amputations. You also then have the potential of illnesses, the acute or the chronic, long-term, prolonged, immediate, but the illnesses then can add up and can definitely ruin your day. The temporary health effects, think about just a little coughing, hacking, a little irritation. You also have long-term diseases. We'll touch on some of the long-term diseases as we go through and how an exposure now, unprotected, could cause diseases to materialize in your body 30 to 40 years down the road. So it does make a difference. And God forbid, hopefully none of you ever have to experience or be on a job site where there's a death that actually occurs. But as we talk, talked on the HASCOM, unfortunately, it's looking at that, that kind of exposure to both physical and chemical hazards and how individuals aren't really paying attention to what they're doing sometimes on job sites that ultimately lead, unfortunately, to deaths occurring on job sites. If you remember from the HASCOM, they average right at around four deaths per day on construction sites. So with the dose, the dose response, I touched on that just a little while ago. As you look at this little bit of a graph or this table, if you will, the dose along the bottom, depending on how and what you're taking in your system, will then cause the response, which is in that left-hand side of, of the uh, graph. And as the response then changes, that creates that dose response curve. All of us have a different dose response curve. The example I'm gonna use next is then gonna be alcohol and alcohol consumption. And everyone that, that has been around anyone that drinks or has seen anyone consuming alcohol, you can see different people have different reactions. When you're talking about the dose response curve, as they start off and just have the first couple of drinks, maybe individuals start getting unsteady, might have a little bit of issues. As they then consume a little bit more alcohol, all of a sudden dizziness might show up or nausea could then start occurring as they start moving up that curve. It's amazing how when we get towards the top of the curve, Suddenly we then think we are uh, able to sing karaoke or to dance. And if the alcohol consumption gets too much, too extreme, it can cause individuals to pass out. And unfortunately in some situations, even get to the point that they overdose on alcohol and then die from that intake of alcohol. This dose response curve will be different from individual to individual. All of us have a different dose response curve. There might be some individual that after two beers, they're unsteady or dizzy, whereas someone else it might not be until they've had 12 beers in their system. It's just our own specific sensitivity to those chemicals and items or things that are then introduced to our bodies. But the dose response curve is something that can be looked at and addressed as it pertains to what you're being exposed to. And depending on what you're being exposed to, as we then are talking about the exposures, we break down the exposures and think of them, whether or not there's a toxicity or a hazard involved. Toxicity, is there a potential for a substance or a chemical to cause harm? And then a hazard, we know the hazard. There is a likelihood that that substance is going to then cause harm, is gonna bother you, 
is going to then have long-term repercussions. So toxicity, the potential, the hazard, and OSHA, OSHA wants your employer to protect you from any chemical or physical hazards. And that's that, those items that could or would cause the harm. Okay, the second activity on your handout sheet. If you would, think about the different routes of exposure, how chemicals or different types of contaminants might get into your body or how those contaminants could affect your body, if you would. So I'll, I'll be quiet for another, uh, another minute and give you guys a chance to write down eh, about five different ones. There's five different ones. See how many of them you might be able to get. Okay, that's been just about a minute. Hopefully some of you guys got uh, got a couple of uh, ideas as to what you thought a route of exposure or how something could affect you. All right, with the exposures, the most common one is inhalation. You breathing it in. We're human vacuum cleaners. If you've ever been in a room and seen it, the beam of sunlight coming in through a window and you look at that beam of sunlight, you can see the stuff that's floating in the air. If you look anywhere else in the room, those little, those little particles that we can't see suddenly aren't, aren't observable. But inhalation, we then draw and breathe those kind of particles into our bodies all the time. Number two is then ingestion. You somehow either eat or drink or get something into your digestive system. The third one is absorption. Chemicals can, can absorb into our skin and get into our bodies through the act, act of absorption. Contact, something just getting on our skin and causing damage then to our skin. And fifth and final, but definitely not the least, is injection, a chemical getting injected into our body. So with, with these different routes, like I already said, stated, the most common route of entry is the inhalation. You're looking at being in an environment where you have the potential of inhaling those chemicals right into your lungs, those gases, the vapors, the mist, the different fumes, those gases and chemicals can then instantly and quickly transition from your lungs right into your bloodstream. Once it gets into the bloodstream, it is then carried throughout the whole body. And we'll talk about the effects of those chemicals getting to different areas of your body in just a little while. But gases, vapors, and having then the proper type of protection, respiratory protection, so that you don't inhale those items right into the lungs is huge. Dust and fibers is huge for construction projects. You're talking about the dust coming from demolition, from everyday work on a construction site. The asbestos fibers, I'll touch on asbestos fibers in a little while. But inhalation, the most common way that chemicals get into or contaminants get into our body. Number two is ingestion. Hopefully, no one in here would ever sit down and have lunch with hands that look like that. You have the potential, if there's something on your hands, of getting into your digestive system, getting into your body through the digestive tract. Your digestive tract won't always eliminate those contaminants. So going out of your way to wash your hands, being as vigilant as possible to not get stuff on your hands and introduce those items from your hands into your body. And you're talking about eating, drinking, smoking, applying cosmetics, anything that allows those contaminants or potential contaminants to get into the system is what we're looking at trying to eliminate by being conscious of that ingestion possibility. So washing your hands. Absorption is in the third of the different routes of entry. The skin, the largest organ of the body, is going to then protect us for the most part of anything getting into our different systems. But with absorption, you still have the potential 
of both chemical damage in the skin and also absorbing or getting into the skin. And if you have a penetration, if you then step on a nail, if you then get, get stuck with a needle, you then can get something introduced to your body that normally your body does not have the capability of handling. So here we're going to do the third and final of our activities then for the day. On your handout sheet, you actually then have um, a list at the very bottom of the sheet, activity three. And if you would, go ahead and rate from one to five, what is the area of skin that has the, the ability to absorb chemicals the fastest? So number one would be the one that, that allows chemicals to be absorbed in the fastest. Five being the slowest or the, the most resilient, if you will, of the skin tissue. I'll go ahead and be quiet for a second and let you guys rate those from one to five. All right, let's see how, uh, how you guys did on this one. All right, the number one, the fastest one, it actually then absorbs chemicals in about 300 times faster than any other area of your body is the groin. Actually had a heavy equipment mechanic that ended up with grease along the front of his brand new blue jeans. He used a, an actual solvent to then degrease the front of his jeans, trying to save his jeans. 30 minutes later, he was face down in the dirt from the actual solvent being absorbed in through his groin. Number two, bottom of your feet. It's amazing the stories I've heard of hockey players actually putting chewing tobacco between their toes. I've actually then had people that have talked about putting Vicks Vapor Rub on the bottom of their feet so they don't have to smell it, but it actually absorb in, absorbs into the body very fast and still does the same type of effect of helping to break down the congestion in the chest and in the lungs. Number three, then is the eyelids. And the eyelids is, is one of those areas that's got very thin skin in and around the eyelid, but it doesn't have a whole lot of capillary or blood flow through there. But it would absorb in very fast on the eyelids if you get a chemical in your eyes or in your eyelids. It will then easily and quickly then absorb in and through that. Armpits would then be number four. Armpits is just a little bit thicker skin than the eyelid, but it still is an area where chemicals would and could absorb in fairly quick. And then the rest of the body, the skin, the torso, falls into the, the fifth and final. There's individuals in here that have probably at one point in time have used some kind of solvent, some kind of parts cleaner or gasoline to then clean the grease or the oil off their hands. It did a great job of getting the grease and oil off, but if you look at your hands afterwards, your, hand have, your hands actually then have a a white kind of gray shadowy look to them. That solvent has actually removed the oil that's actually lubricating your skin. And if you continue to do that, it's amazing the damage you can do to your skin, to your dermis, and you end up with these really dry, crusty hands. But that's amazing how that solvent, if you look at the SDS, the safety data sheet, it might even have on there for that solvent to prevent skin contact and then we have individuals that are actually using that to actually clean their hands. So SDSs, I told you, they're gonna keep coming back up a couple of times as I go through this. It's a great resource in knowing how effective you can be at protecting yourselves from any of the chemicals and things you might be working around. So the SDSs are a great resource. Excellent. So with the contact, you know, that was the absorption the last one. Number four here is contact. Contact is then not a chemical that's actually getting into your bloodstream and actually penetrating through the dermis or the skin, but is then doing serious damage then to the skin itself. And you guys, you can see that there's some nasty rashes, blisters. You can get some really non-healing wounds that really look nasty, and it just makes life really uncomfortable. So be conscious of, be careful of, watch out for any of those different chemicals. And by wearing the proper PPE, guess what you eliminate? Guess what you then do not have the chance and possibility of happening to you if you then are properly protected. The fifth and final of the different routes of entry is injection. 
Now, injection is not a common entry on industrial settings, but it is fairly common in construction settings. Now, with industrial, you still have the chance and possibilities of punctures and cuts, and you do have some processing lines in some systems that have hydraulic or pneumatic lines, but it doesn't seem like it's quite as prevalent in the industrial side. But on the construction side, unfortunately, hydraulic systems, when you're talking about some of the different hydraulic systems on some of the systems, up in the 1,200 PSI pounds per square inch range, pneumatic systems with some of the different air tools that are out there. It's amazing then the pneumatic tools that have become in commonplace in the construction industry. But the images you're gonna see here on the left-hand side is a picture of a gentleman's hand that actually had a hydraulic fluid injection. You can see where it then just, here's the skin right there between his third and fourth finger on his left hand. And this gentleman luckily was able to save his hand, but the next shot is pretty graphic, but this is after all the debridement, all the treatment, as they then went out of the way to protect his fingers, his fingers, some of the slides I couldn't show here on the, that were even more graphic than this, actually had his fingers swollen up almost to the point that there was no space between any of the fingers at all. I mean, just amazing. You can see how far down the, through the palm of his hand, all the way down into his wrist, the hydraulic fluid then started to spread in his body and causing then damage and then causing tissue damage. Hydraulic fluid does not like the human body. If you're working around any kind of system like that, hydraulic or pneumatic, realize both the high pressure liquids and the high pressure air can cause damage. You don't want high pressure air injected in your body either. Air bubbles would definitely ruin your day. So now, depending on your exposure, we talked about the routes. Is it an acute exposure or was it a chronic exposure? Acute, it's severe, it's immediate. It's bothering you, it's hurting you right now. It's making you sick or God forbid, it puts you into a pine box almost immediately. Acute does not mean that it's mild. It does mean that it's then hitting you then hard and then doing damage immediately to you or whoever might be exposed to it. And when you're talking about acute exposures, whether it's contact, whether it's ingestion, whether it's inhaled, you can see the images here. This, this lady actually then had a chemical burn on her hand, and you can see the progression of the chemical burn through the blistering and the tissue damage phases from a simple chemical burn. And this was a chemical this lady actually worked with all the time. It was another type of solvent, but unfortunately she then got the full concentration of the solvents on her hand and experienced this type of burn from that contact. Now ingested. If you get a chemical in your system that's, that causes severe nausea or vomiting, or it hits the digestive system that the diarrhea kicks in, you're talking about immediately that it does that kind of damage. And the, the inhalation is pretty straightforward. You can feel the coughing, wheezing, and you might have the burning of the throat. You then will have issues or, 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 or a fight, if you will, to then get a breath. So acute exposures immediately, right now. The chronic, long-term, low-level, stretch over a long period of time. Like I said earlier, some of these different chronic exposures might not have any kind of injuries, illnesses, or symptoms and problems showing up until well down the road, anywhere from 10 to 20 years. When we're talking about one of the types of chronic exposures that people in the construction industry get exposed to, it's asbestos fibers. Unfortunately, asbestos fibers have been used for years in all kinds of different products. There's, it's still in some of the different products coming in from overseas. You're talking about a fiber that if you breathe it in, you can actually get cancers in the lungs. You can actually get cancers of the lung cavity, the actual lining of the stomach and the lungs itself. And mesothelioma is a disease that we've seen the commercials for years now of individuals that they're trying to get them compensated for any kind of exposure to asbestos in a previous time frame, because mesothelioma usually doesn't show up until anywhere from 30 to 40 years after that asbestos fibers got into that victim's body and then got embedded into the chest cavity or the stomach cavity in the lining of the lungs or the lining of the stomach. 
Mesothelioma is a nasty one. Really no known effective treatment for it. But this is then from that chronic exposure to asbestos. And asbestos fibers are even in brake pads. They're in, in all kinds of different products. So being aware of, being conscious of, being protected from those types of exposures are huge on construction sites. Now, with some different types of chemicals here around, you can actually suffer both at a, an acute and a long-term chronic. Toluene is an excellent, excellent example. It's a very common product inside different paints and in different solvents. Uh, you could have someone that just smelling the fumes can actually then have the irritation of the respiratory system. You can get severe head dizziness. You can get headaches. You can get a little bit of it, a nausea. Um, and if you get it on your skin or if you put your hand down into then some of these solvents, it can irritate the skin and dry the skin out significantly. Tyulene is very effective. You used to use it in the Air Force for cleaning off rubberized uh, uh, components on pressure suits. Then clean up then the steel uh, systems and take the, the rubber, rubber plastic glues off of them. But then the chronic exposure to repeated, if you will, vapors can damage the liver, can damage the brain cells. If you get the fumes into the system, into the bloodstream, as it goes through the bloodstream, that's where that damage of the liver and the brain cells occur. So it's how it's introduced, how it gets into the system. Now, when you think about chemicals in the body, you, you have to then realize that our bodies are able in some situations to actually metabolize and break down the chemicals that get into the, into the system. Alcohol is an excellent example here. Different individuals can metabolize alcohol at different rates. We then are gonna take a little while to then break down that alcohol and allow it to decompose. And then as we then go through that metabolism process, it then just goes, goes and passes through the system. But our bodies can metabolize some different chemicals. Unfortunately, our bodies also can store different chemicals. Lead is a perfect example here. Lead has been found in the large bones of the human body up to 30 years after someone has been exposed to lead. The Romans had a high incidence of lead in the bones that researchers and archeologists have found in some old Roman crypts. They then used lead to actually then sweeten their wine and sweeten some of their foods. Lead has a sweet flavor to it, but it also has a serious potential damaging effect that can have on us and God forbid if we take it home to our families, to the, to the spouse and the kids. So there is the possibility of storing it, but we also then have the possibility of excreting then the chemicals. That's where it then gets filtered out, passes on on through. The problem is you have the potential of damaging the liver, the kidneys, those filtering mechanisms so that the chemicals can pass out and then be excreted, if you will, from the body. Unfortunately, chemicals then have, a, have the possibility that if they do get in the bloodstream, as they go through the bloodstream, they can then damage different organs. The target organ on that safety data sheet for the chemical you're gonna look at or that you're gonna then potentially work with, target organs will be listed. If you get the chemical in you, what target organ will be damaged? And as we look at this, it's looking at the concentration of the chemical and the different body parts. You can have multiple body parts that get affected. And when you're talking about body parts and with the bloodstream, think about the, the actual chemicals, the vapors getting into the bloodstream, and as it passes and transitions through the lungs, it could do damage to the lungs, the alveoli of the lungs, and then once it gets in the bloodstream, it can move all over the place. We look, already looked at some of the damage it could possibly do to the skin. The circulatory system, it could damage both the veins, the arteries, even down to damaging the bone marrow in our bone, the bone marrow that produces our red and white blood cells. If it's in the bloodstream, it can damage the brain, the central nervous system. That is the main, if you will, central control of our bodies. It controls almost all of our functions. We're talking about damage to these target organs that's irreparable, cannot be repaired in any way. The liver, the kidneys, filtering out any of the damage. We then saw in the HASCOM presentation, the damage done to the reproductive organs of those 60 individuals out in California that were working at the petrochemical uh, plants and actually became sterile 
from working on and making then the, the pesticides that were a byproduct coming off that, that process. And this unfortunate individual here with the picture was an individual that had his eyes affected by a sodium vapor light that he was moving, it dropped, the actual bulb exploded, and he then got the sodium vapor into his eyes, and you can see the damage it did to the actual retina, and then the red area is the normal white area of his eyes, and he lost his vision. So being aware of, being conscious of, and understanding that you have the potential for repercussions on anything you're exposed to is then huge. Each and every one of us will have a different interaction to whatever we're exposed to. You are going to be the best way of telling if you're suffering or you're being bothered by a chemical. It's going to feel different. Every one of us are going to expose, or any one of us being exposed are going to have different experiences. And if you have multiple chemicals, you might have medications in your system, they can end up making then that mixture of the chemicals and anything else in your system even more toxic, more dangerous. Anything we put in, anything that we're exposed to has the potential of being dangerous for us. And as we then think about all the different factors that come into the toxicity, uh, there's a couple of different ones here. The chemical factors. What is the composition, the characteristics? How about the properties? Liquid, gas, or solid? Think about the actual different states of the different chemicals you might be around. Solid, pretty straightforward. There's that shape, there's that quantity. You can see them. It might, it might be a block of something. It could then be a, a, a powder. Uh, it could be granular. But then liquid, the nice thing about liquids is that they're going to actually then take the shape of whatever container you put them in. But unfortunately, liquids can evaporate. They can go into a gaseous state. Gases, the vapors, the mist, they then have a, the possibility of not being defined, and they can actually spread out and fill the volume or fill the void, fill the area that you're working in. So being protected from the gases is huge. But again, chemicals come in all three of those different states. And being aware of what you're working in around is then huge. Now, another factor, if you will, for toxicity is what is your overall exposure? What was the dose or concentration? How much of that chemical? How did it get into your system or on your system? What was that route of exposure? And how long were you exposed to that chemical or to that toxic environment? All of those come in and play a factor in the overall effects of the toxicity of that chemical on your system. And each, like I said earlier, each and every one of us has a different susceptibility. And each and every one of us, you know, depending on our age, uh, you're talking about health effects. Individuals have different health issues that they're dealing with and might be taking medications for on a daily basis, even down to pain meds, uh, blood thinners, uh, any kind of, of uh, different types of, of chemicals that could be taken that could be uh, ingested or in our bodies to help our health so that we can continue working. Now, unfortunately for females, think about any kind of exposure to a toxic environment and the effects of that chemical on the fetus. Unfortunately, it does happen. Male versus female, uh, genetics, all of those have the potential for making different individuals more susceptible to anything that they might be exposed to. And above and beyond all of those factors, and now let's put an environmental factor in. Now let's put you out to work on a job site or doing something on a really hot, humid day. And then have, have you sloshing around in liquid or in, in this situation, recovery down in um, New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina, and think about all the potential chemicals that might be in that water that these guys are trying to then go through and function in. So all of those different factors have the potential of making then the environment you're working in much more strenuous and potentially more dangerous for you on these different types of job sites. So what the employer has to do is they have to then look at what you're being exposed to. They have to then go through and actually look at the hazard and get a feel for the hazard. And all of the different exposure limits I'm going to talk, to, or talk about here are based on working an eight-hour work shift. 
and the employer is monitoring you while you're working in that environment on that eight-hour shift, and the personal sampling that's collected is going to determine whether or not you need to be protected, some of the different uh, PPE options that are necessary and required. So unfortunately, with exposure limits and with personal monitoring, uh, they only evaluate inhalation. And unfortunately, some of the numbers, some of the values are kind of outdated. They don't have really good, adequate research. They haven't put a lot of funding into continuing. Uh, we've already got the numbers. We don't have to then research it much anymore. Um, and, and so there is some, some limitations and some drawbacks to some of the numbers we're going to go through or some of the values we're going to look at. And unfortunately, with, with most of these exposure limits, they do not take into account you being exposed to multiple different chemicals and mul multiple different contaminants. And what the combination of those different exposures or those different contaminants might mean to the human body. So as we're looking at exposure limits, they're going to be measured in, in, in a couple of different ways. As they collect the sample, as your employer determines the environment you're working in, the results of the analysis of the personal monitoring, if they're looking at gases and vapors, they're gonna come back in, in a measurement of either parts per million or in parts per billion. Parts per million basically is then looking at basically one drop of black ink in, in 14 gallons of water. That's a part per million. If you're talking about a part per billion, now you're talking about that one drop of black ink in 14,000 gallons of water. Just to kind of give you a, a, an idea of, of how big of, an, of a separation we're having here when we're talking parts per million and parts per billion. But the monitoring that's done in and around your personal space, if you're being exposed to gas and vapors, the results will then come back in either PPM or in PPB, parts per million, parts per billion. Now, if we're looking at you being exposed to particulates, the measurement for, for particulates that usually come back is then in a volume of air. And you're looking at a weight per volume of that air. And with that concentration, now you're looking at milligrams per cubic meter. Milligrams. You're talking, you're talking 1,000 milligrams is the weight of a dollar bill. You're not talking a, a, a huge amount of weight. But when you're looking at the volume of the air, you're talking about a cubic meter of being a the size of a public mailbox, a nice blue mailbox that you're putting your letters in. So you're talking a very small amount in that mailbox, milligrams per cubic meter. Also, micrograms, the funny looking U that's on there is, is a symbol for a microgram. Microgram per cubic meter is even smaller. You're talking one billionth of a gram. The way I've always explained, explained this in lead classes is if you take a penny, a penny is about, a, is about the weight of, of two grams approximately. If you cut that penny into two million equal sized pieces, each one of those pieces would be a microgram. A very small, small amount of weight and you then get down to micrograms. But when you're talking about lead exposure, lead exposure is measured in micrograms. Asbestos exposure that I talked about, uh, asbestos just a little while ago, the measurement for asbestos is in fibers per cc, the amount of fibers in a cc, a cubic centimeter. A cubic centimeter is about the size of a sugar cube. So all these different measurements have been used to establish these different exposure limits. OSHA has established the permissible exposure limit, the PEL. The permissible exposure limit is that line in the sand. It is the legal line in the sand that if you're exposed at or above the PEL, you have to be wearing a respirator. Your employers are required to make sure you're protected if you're above that PEL. It's measured in the parts per million and the milligrams per cubic meter. The lower the number of the exposure and the lower the number of the PEL, means the more dangerous that environment uh, possibly is. So you're talking of being protected once you get at or above that permissible exposure limit. It's OSHA legally required. Now we have a couple other exposure limits that are recommended exposure limits. 
Threshold limit values are recommended by ACGIH, the American Conference of Government Industrial Hygienists. They are the oldest organization that actually has come up with exposure limit recommendations. Their threshold limit values were actually used by OSHA to create the OSHA PEL. But their recommendations from ACJH don't always coincide or are not always the same as OSHA's. So again, this is a recommendation. Still measured in parts per million, still measured in milligrams per cubic meter, but it's still, still a recommendation based on that eight hour work shift, that normal routine eight hour work shift. The last of the, of the recommended versions of the exposure limits is from NIOSH. NIOSH has their recommended exposure limits. That's where I talked about the NIOSH pocket guide. And NIOSH does a lot of safety and health research. They send their information off to OSHA. They send their, their safety and health research off to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. It's still measured in parts per million or milligrams per cubic meter, but NIOSH uses a 10 hour exposure shift versus the eight hour that OSHA and ACGIH use. So recommended versus required. OSHA required the TLVs and the RELs, the threshold limit values, the recommended exposure limits, those are recommendations. So as we've been looking at this, as we then look at a summary, the dose makes the poison, the amount you take in, the length of time you're exposed to it, how much of a dose you receive can determine what the damage is to you, to your body, both short-term and long-term. Inhalation, the most common routes of entry, the most common way for chemicals or anything to get into our bodies, the vacuum cleaners that we are. But we still have, we still have absorption, we still have contact, we still have ingestion, and we still have injection. But the most common is that inhalation. Chronic versus acute, is it making you sick right now? Is it putting you into a very, very, very significantly safety slash health hazard? Or is it a long-term exposure to a chemical or to an environment? Uh, silica dust is one of the big things that they're pushing on right now. OSHA's come out with their new rules and the requirements they have for exposure to silica dust because they see the long-term damage caused to the human lungs by breathing in silica dust over the course of a lifetime or if you will a course of a of a career and you're talking serious scarring of the lung tissue we have individuals that are not breathing off oxygen hoses in order to survive because there's so much scar tissue in their lungs that they cannot do the normal oxygen carbon dioxide transfer and the oxygen has a hard time getting into the bloodstream so it, it's huge on the chronic side human sensitivity we went through some of the different factors we all have the potential for being more sensitive and react differently depending on what we're being exposed to. Male, female, age, health, it all makes a difference. The environment we're working in makes a difference. So be careful, be conscious of, watch out for, and use those safety data sheets to then realize what is the potential for the exposure to the chemical that you're working with on a job site. And we talked about those exposures, those occupational exposure limits. The OSHA legal and the, the NIOSH and the ACGIH recommended exposure limits and protecting ourselves from those exposures and from those values. In conclusion, just like with the has comment, if you have any comments, any questions, any issues, anything that you want to then discuss further, don't hesitate to give us a call. We're at your disposal. We're here then to assist you in anything that we might be able to do for you. If you want more information, go to cpwr.com. The website is a wealth of knowledge, safety knowledge, information on how to keep yourself safe on job sites and working in the construction trade. We're here to try and protect you guys as much as possible, give you the information you need to stay as safe as possible out on these job sites. You take care, have a good career, and the best of luck to you. Goodbye.